seem a bit disheveled like I am. These examiners kind of take a lot out of me and running. Shut the biology room this morning. Of course, the air is not on. There's 300 people in there, so I feel like I'm just like drenched. So <laughs> it's been been a fun fun start to the morning. So we're going here a little bit late. Um, kind of mentioned some things off the top before we can dive into the new material. So I put up the next kind of set of sample questions. So I got this tongue with a student the other day. You know, these sample questions. You know, when we're doing things in class, I think I'm talking through examples. I think it can seem kind of easy, but you know, how do you actually apply some of what we're learning? These are really going to be questions, kind of how we actually apply this, right? And the types of questions you'll see on those quizzes. So, excuse me. So that next quiz, um, I will probably put up after Tuesday's class. It kind of depends on how much material we get through today, but I think we should be fine. We're actually in a pretty good place. I'll probably start going a little bit slower, maybe rehashing some stuff we've already talked about, just seeing more examples, because really we're a little bit ahead of kind of where I wanted to be. So you'll see that quiz after class on Tuesday. Um, the next kind of problem set will also, I'll probably assign after Tuesday as well. We may, we, we should have covered everything after Tuesday's class for you to start working on that. Um, I might even post it up early if I get a chance on Friday. Um, I just wanted to kind of go over a couple of things based off what we've talked about in class, just to make sure it kind of is still lining up with what I originally had written in that problem set and kind of my expectations for you guys. So you should probably see that pop up maybe before class on Tuesday. Um, just kind of depends how to kind of review that, okay? So I want you guys to be able to start working on it as early as possible. Now you still have a current problem set, which is why I'm also hesitant to I just throw another one out there at you, but that problem set two is due when? At the end of the day, tomorrow, right? Friday. So. If you have any last minute questions, I said I had some new uh, office hours this week. That's people stopped by yesterday, 10 to 12. They're going to be on Friday, 10 to 12 as well. Okay, so if you have any last minute questions, feel free to kind of shoot me an email, stop by my office tomorrow. Um, and I think that should be kind of all of the housekeeping stuff. I updated, if you're kind of using an old file from earlier in the week, I added some stuff in. I updated that. Uh, PowerPoints for week five slides. I also updated this MLR in class. Not a whole lot of additional stuff in there, but if you are working from that old file, we might start going through some things today that aren't in it. Okay, so if you already have that file, then you re-download it or place it on Canvas. Okay. All right. Any questions for me before we kind of jump into things here? Okay. I also am on the verge of not posting these recordings based off of how many people are showing up to class. Um, but I guess I can only incentivize so much. And for those of you who are here, I've also kind of heard like it's, a, it's kind of nice to have those recordings go back through, especially for the state of part, right? Going back through those assignments. So I won't do that, right? But um, good on you guys for being here. I think uh, I think your, your fellow classmates are going to have a rude awakening when the exam gets here. But how many people are we supposed to have? I think we're supposed to be closer to like 30 students, right? So I don't, yeah. <laughs> um, and I know some of them who are here, so I, I know there's a pretty good handful. Um, I don't, you know, there's a pretty wide variance on the quiz grades. And um, I'm guessing if I correlated that with attendance, probably would be uh, negative, right? <laughs> the more you attend, the, the uh, or sorry, Missing attendance. So the more you miss, right, the kind of worse you're doing on, on these quizzes. But we're going to do so much. So, um, also to be fair, I know I have a few students who kind of cheat and come to my other section. It's not really a good thing to do because there's not as many seats there. So uh, you could show up and not have anywhere to sit. Um, but anyway, so I digress. I've already started late. Now I'm wasting time to kind of complaining. So let's jump into it. Um, so when we have these, Regressions, right? We've talked about dummy variables, multiple dummy variables. Um, ultimately, our, our goal is to be able to make predictions. So this is an example where we had some imperfect multicollinearity, but we're just going to ignore that for a second, just to kind of use it as an example to how do we make predictions for this y variable, right? So whenever we're making predictions, the only thing that we need are these coefficients, and then some hypothetical values for whatever person we're thinking about making a prediction for. So Last class, I ended with kind of looking at Stata, and we had, where was it? Should be salary data. We we're kind of using this predict command, right? So um, what that did was it made predictions of the Y variable for every single observation in the data, 
in our data set. <laughs> However, sometimes we might want to make predictions for things that aren't in our, like, like here, I only have so many observations of quarterbacks. Maybe I want to think of like this hypothetical quarterback, right? Maybe if, you know, this kind of seems, seems like a weird example, but like maybe they're coming over from like, I don't know, Canadian Football League or something. And I want to predict what I think their total value of their contract would be based off of their performance in that other league, right? So they don't exist in my data set, but I still want to make predictions for them. So what I would do is kind of take these results. And all I'm doing when I'm making predictions, so here we had kind of wage as a function of IQ, age, and experience. Right? So when we run that regression, we're coming up with predictions or kind of sample coefficients, right? I said predictions, we're coming up with sample kind of estimates of what these slope coefficients are. And if I use those, I would then not be finding my actual y value, but my predicted y value. So if I go back kind of to that slide, all I'm doing is I'm looking at that intercept of that constant. It was, I'm going to egregiously round here, but it was about negative 644. I'm then going to take the coefficient associated with IQ, 8.42, multiply that by whatever person's IQ I'm interested in kind of making a prediction for. I'm going to run out of room here, so I'm going to go down a line. I then go to my next variable, age. It has a slope coefficient of 23.17 times whatever the individual's age is. And then what's my final one experience? Oops. It's actually negative. So negative 1.44 times whatever the experience of the individual is. Right? So on that slide, we said we want to make a prediction for someone who has an IQ of 105, has 10 years of experience, and whose age is 45. Hopefully, this is a pretty simple thing to get entered into our calculator. Right? So we're making these predictions. All we're doing is taking these hypothetical values for these different variables x, multiplying them by the slope coefficients. And then we always have to remember we have to include the intercept as well. So that's an easy step that we can often forget. Right? So if I'm thinking about those regression results, right, all I was doing was grabbing those slope coefficients associated with each variable, and then also including my intercept and my constant when making my prediction. Any questions on that idea? Should be pretty straightforward. Um, now I've got an example here, data, and we're gonna switch it up a little bit. So make sure you go to the top. We said every single time, if I'm ever using a data set that's kind of from this free kind of rep repository, which just double checking, because I, I don't think I've, have you guys been able to do this okay? Has anyone tried any opening these, these free data sets or we'll following them for after class? No one? Okay. So if you are, you're following along and you want to, you need to make sure that you kind of run this SSC install. I always put it up at the top of the file. That means I can now use these free data sets. So I'm gonna come down here. I'm gonna clear just in case I had any data open on your device if you, you know, left data open and you had some old data set. You want to clear that out, and then this BQs, and I'm going to call this file smoke. I'm not calling it. I'm when I say I'm calling it. I'm like downloading the file smoke or opening it. So I run that. It gives this free data set. It's got um, cigarette prices. It's got cigarette use. Uh, I forget exactly how this is represented. I think it's like monthly use or something like that. Age, um, um, racial identifier. So we've got some variables in here. So let's say I want to run this regression where I'm trying to predict cigarettes from someone, you know, cigarette use from someone's years of education, the cigarette price in that state, the average cigarette price, whether or not the individual's white, their age, and their income level. Okay. So that's going to be kind of the regression that we want to run. So I'm going to do that. We're going to take a look at it here. So I've got all these coefficients now, right? I could make predictions for the number of cigarettes someone's using a month based off of hypothetical values for all these other independent or predicting you know, variables I've included on the right-hand side. So one way we can do this, we can always do this by hand. So like on the next problem set, if you're asked to do this, um, you know, I would probably ask you to do it in Stata because I'm about to show you how you do it in Stata. But for the quizzes, you could be asked a question, you'd have to do this by hand, right? So we just kind of went through how you would do it by hand. It's just one simple 
equation where you're multiplying and adding. Right? That's all it really is. What we can do instead of though, instead of having to like round these values and write them all, type them all into our calculator, there's this kind of nice kind of, um, feature, which is once I run a regression, it stores those slope coefficients behind the scenes. So when I put underscore B and then these kind of brackets, right? Whatever I put in those brackets, it's gonna take the slope coefficient from that variable. Now for the constant, it's a little bit different. The way that Excel kind of labels the constant is this underscore CONS. So that's always gonna be like our intercept. So whatever regression we just ran, it's gonna take the slope coefficient for, well, it's not slope coefficient here, it's the intercept coefficient. It's then gonna to add to that the next variable, education, right? So underscore B, education, that just means beta, you know, whatever that slope coefficient was on education, right? And you have to put the actual name of the variable here, right? So I kind of notice education, SIG price, whether or not they were white, age, and income. Now I can just play around with hypothetical values. So I'm going to use this display command. You could generate a new variable, right, if you wanted to, and it would just put a column. I'll show you that in a second. But this display is just going to give us that prediction, right? So I think in my example, I said what? Someone who has 12 years of education. So I take the slope coefficient on education, multiply that by 12. Someone who the cigarette price in their state on average is $5 a pack. This is some older data. Um, so take that slope coefficient on cigarette price, multiply it by five. Whether or not they were white, the individual is white. This is just a dummy variable. So they're white, it would be a one. So just multiply that slope coefficient by one. Then take the slope coefficient of age, person's 30, multiply by 30, income, multiply by 45,000. Yeah. So when you have a dummy variable like, <clears throat> like uh, white, for example, mm -hmm. what if it, I'm assuming the other, the other one is like non-white. So if it's non-white, your coefficient is zero, right? How, so that's going to, will yeah. that not mess up your, so your equation? Here I've got for white individual, if I wanted to change this to making the same exact prediction, but for someone who's black, mm -hmm. it's not that my slope coefficient is zero. We want to be careful how we're saying this. It's that that slope coefficient would be so getting multiplied by zero. by zero. Yeah, but it'll make it zero. Exactly. So I wouldn't really have to, if I can see ahead of time that it's going to be in the zero group. Yeah, you just leave it out. Yeah, so if I run this just to kind of show you. So I run this one. This is going to be the predict prediction for someone who's non-white, right? If I had left this out and ran it, I should get the exact same value. Yep. So if I can kind of see ahead of time, the prediction I want to make is for someone who's going to have a zero for that dummy variable, I really don't have to include it. Yeah. Now, if I run this for a white individual, it's going to take this value, and what's the only difference that I should see? It's going to be this value plus what? Your constant. So my constants in, so if I'm looking at the in, or your coefficient for, uh, yeah, so for my one. constants in both, but this one, right, we just said you can actually get rid of that slope coefficient on white. So the only difference should be what? Adding the slope coefficient. Uh, 0 0.265, right? So we should be only seeing what? This should be just over 14. Sure enough, if we run this, we get something just over 14, right? Just adding in that slope coefficient on our dummy variable. Yep. Any questions? I know this is small. I, have, I can't kind of zoom in on, on this output here. I think if I make it larger, it just aligns it. it doesn't change kind of the size. This is why kind of having this open running, running as we kind of go, so you can see on your screen might be kind of helpful. Can make this bigger, but I can't make the, the other city. Yeah. Any questions on this idea here? Okay. So we kind of already got to this last class, but just to kind of reiterate, you know, how could I come up with predictions for every observation in this data set? Well, that's where I would run my regression. It now stores those slope coefficients behind the scenes. But instead of typing this all out, let's say I wanted to make a prediction for every single observation. I don't want to have to type out underscore cons, underscore education times education, right? Or, under, or underscore B sig price times sig price. If I run this predict command, it essentially will use this equation, but 
for every single observation, it's going to take its actual x values for that observations and plug them in. Before, up here, we were just doing it for a hypothetical person. This is going to be doing it for the actual observations in our data set or the actual people in our data set. Now, it'll also create a new variable. So if I run this predict command, go over here. I've now got this predicted cigarette use variable, right? Now it's going to vary from the actual cigarette use here. In fact, when I have something that comes in like this, this cigarette variable, it was like survey data. So it was like very uh, discrete in, in the values we see. See so a lot of zeros, then you kind of notice 10, 20, 30. There's not, you know, they were kind of put in these categories. Do you smoke between zero and 10, 10 and 20, et cetera. Um, a couple of them, they had like, what are there? there was a three somewhere. Yeah, they had kind of like three, I think maybe the low category was zero to three and then there was a three to 10. But, you know, my actual Y values are gonna be very different than these predicted Y values. So for instance, for some people who don't even smoke cigarettes, based off of the other variables that we're using to predict cigarette use, they should be predicted to be smoking eight cigarettes a month, or eight, buying eight packs a month, whatever this, this unit ended up being. So we're always gonna have errors. We can manually calculate the errors. We said, I kind of showed you that last class. We would just use these predicted values, subtract them from the actual values, right? So if you wanted to, We would just take cigarette use, the actual Y values, and subtract this new variable, which was the predicted Y values, right? We could do that. If we do, we should get the exact same value. If I run this predict command, I want to create this new variable called error term. And instead of just putting predict, that made actual prediction for the Y value. This is going to tell me, okay, it's going to calculate the predicted Y values and then subtract them from the actual Y values and tell me the error, all right? So it just goes one step further. It should be the exact same thing as if I kind of did it myself using a couple more lines of code. So if we run this, sure enough, we see we're getting the exact same errors no matter which way we do it. Okay. And then we said we can kind of summarize those errors and kind of see this one, you know, does this kind of look like it up? Oh, it's uh, a best linear unbiased estimator, kind of all of our assumptions, kind of where we have the expected value of our error term is zero. Well, 2.8 times e to the negative 0 0.09, that moves on, means I move my decimal what? To the left. Nine places to the left. This is basically zero, right? So here I do have an expected value of my error term, which is basically zero, right? So I, you know, these regression results should be, um, you know, satisfying that assumption of the, the blue kind of assumptions we had. Um, what else do I want to come in? So that's just kind of making predictions here. Um, any questions on this before we keep? So I think I kind of skipped around a little bit. We'll come back to economic significance, which I kind of have down here. So if you looked at this education variable, all right, the p-value is 0.027. In fact, if we're looking at all of our predicting variables, it's the one that we can kind of, you know, reject the null at the highest level. It has the smallest p-value. Now, income is fairly, you know, fairly statistically significant as well. Both have a p-value less than an alpha of 0.05 and 0.1. And so we could reject the null that there's no effect at the 10 and 5% level. So we're instead thinking about, well, the size of those is pretty small, but is this an actually like large effect? So you start to think about, when we see these slope coefficients, it's always gonna be the effect of one unit. Well, if I'm thinking about something like income, the effect of a one more dollar, that's going to be relatively small, right? But I know that I can see people have 10,000 more dollars of income, and it's not, it's not that crazy. So we'll talk about ways we can kind of measure what we call economic significance. So just because we saw statistical significance, you know, I can have something statistically significant, and if the effect size is really small, we don't really care. So how can we kind of measure this economic significance? Excuse me. So uh, let's say just another example to kind of hammer it home. I was trying to predict GDP uh, based off of the unemployment rate of a country. So I find my slope coefficient and you know unemployment rate, let's say we're measuring it in terms of percentages. So a 1% increase in unemployment rate, my slope coefficient was 10 million. So it would increase the GDP, uh, or sorry, decrease the GDP, that makes more sense, right? By, by 10 million, right? So it was negative 10 million. Well, that's a very large effect. It might seem like it has a lot of economic significance. But if we're measuring GDP, is 10 million a lot of, I mean, 
Now, I, the, some of the poorest countries in the world have GDP far over 10 million, right? So it looks like it might be a kind of small effect if we think about that way. So even though it's a large number, if we think about it, what would like, an, let's say the average GDP is something like $12 trillion, that's 12, $10 trillion, right? Well then, you know, 10, or oh wait, do I have a trillion? No, 10 billion, right? So let's say, and I know obviously these numbers don't match up, but just to kind of make the point, let's say the average GDP is 10 billion. Well then an increase of 10 million doesn't seem like it's quite as much. In fact, we can kind of take a ratio and think about, well, this is only really gonna be like a, a 0.1%, right? If I take the ratio of the two. So what looked like a large effect was a relatively small percent of kind of the average of this variable, right? The average GDP was 10 billion. So this effect size kind of relative to what the mean of this variable is, is relatively small. So this is one way we can measure economic significance. It's kind of the ratio of our slope coefficient to the mean of whatever variable we're looking at the slope coefficient on. Or sorry, not the variable, the, the, the mean of whatever y variable we're trying to predict. Okay. Um, so kind of dividing where that, that mean of that dependent or that y variable is one way we can kind of determine economic significance. So usually what we would then do is everything we do in Stata, right, we set is in proportions or probabilities. The way we talk, we would usually kind of convert that to a percent. So like here I have 0 0.001. I thought of this, this is only a 0.1% change relative to the mean of that GDP variable. So let's look at a different example here. Um, so let's do that same regression with all the same predictors. Um, but now I'm looking at kind of, okay, is, what do I have here? Education, why is this value a little bit different? Did I delete one of the variables here? Education, income, okay, well, I'll change it to match up. We must have done something weird. So I'm looking at education here and it's what? Negative 0.376. So here, thinking about each additional year of education, 0.376, right? I actually had the right value here. I don't know what, what, why, why I must have had just a typo hit the wrong button or hit the wrong number. So I then kind of th think about, all right, well, what's the mean of that Y variable I'm trying to predict or the mean of cigarette use? It was about 8.69. So here's the mean of my dependent variable. So just to kind of, I'll post this again. We'll add in some additional comments here. Here we're looking at the size, you know, the size of the original effect or what my slope coefficient estimate was. It was negative 0.376. Well, relative to the mean, so I just divide it by the mean. It looks like it's about 0.043 or that effect from one more year of education would have increased my y variable by about 4.3% of its mean, right? So that's, you know, you know, there's no hard, you know, threshold or hard and fast cutoff, but that seems like a pretty decent increase, right? 4% 4 is not as small as like we had that 0.1%. Now we can do this for other variables as well. So let's think about, um, oh, what's a good one? So let's do this age variable, right? So negative 0.041. So on age, age, slope coefficient. And I already forgot what it was. So let me move this over here. It's what, negative 0.041? Well, relative to our mean, I can kind of, let me open up Excel to do my calculator here because I definitely can't do that math in my head. So we're going to do what equals 0 0.041 divided by 8.686. Okay. So 0 0.0047. You enter this into a calculator too, if you didn't want to use Excel there. So this effect of being one year older is only increase, or sorry, only decreasing cigarette use by what? About 4.7% of the mean of cigarette use, right? That's a much smaller economic significance, right? It's a much larger, or sorry, much smaller percentage change of my dependent variable than the first variable we were looking at, which was education. So even if everything is statistically significant, 
some variables are going to have more economic significance, right? Um, is this any questions on this idea? Is this making sense what we're doing here? Um, what about, I'm going to kind of jump the gun here, but sometimes we have variables and like that income variable, right? So this is going to be, how would we predict this slope coefficient? So it's 0 0.0001. So how would I predict, or sorry, how would I interpret that slope coefficient? So it's a one unit change in my X variable. So having one more dollar, one more dollar predicts that cigarette use goes up by 0 0.0001 packs per month, or how, I think that was packs per month is how cigarette use is measured. So this looks really, really small, right? We kind of mentioned earlier, like $1 is a small amount. Like usually we see people can have, you know, $10,000 of income, right? So what might make a little more sense, especially for variables like income, is to scale them, right? So now if I create this new variable, I'm gonna call it income two, okay? So all I'm gonna do is take the original income variable and divide it by a thousand. So now, what are the units of this new income variable? Thousands of dollars. So now my interpretation, if I run this regression and I use my new income variable where I scaled it, now this slope coefficient estimates what are the units of this new income variable I created? It's in thousands. So a one unit increase would be an additional thousand dollars of income would predict that my cigarette use goes up by 0.11 packs per month. So it makes it a little bit more realistic. Like we don't see, you know, it's more likely we see like a thousand additional dollars in income as opposed to just one. Uh, but notice, it's actually the exact same value. So all scaling the independent variable does is it just scales up my slope coefficient, right? We're just talking about it in terms of a different number of units now. So if $1, it's in thousands. Also scaling this variable, what do you think happens to the R squared? Yeah, it doesn't change at all, right? Because I've scaled every single value of that variable by the exact same amount. I've divided them all by a thousand. What I'll see is I've got a p value, or sorry, p value, uh, uh, r squared here of 0 0.0106, 0 0.0106, right? Doesn't change my r squared at all. What about the statistical significance of the variable? Well, if I think about statistical significance, so this is where I'm trying to, if you read this, this is some old topics. How do I find a test statistic? It's simply going to be for my slope coefficient. I'll take my slope coefficient estimate and divide it by the standard error. So behind the scenes, how this was calculated, both were using whatever that variable is we're looking at. So if I scale both of these, like you can kind of think about it as like I'm dividing both by a thousand. This would just cancel out. I should get the exact same test statistic, which would give me the exact same p-value. So if we look at those results, sure enough, on income, that p-value is 0 0.036. When we scaled it, this new income two variable, which was in thousands, still 0 0.036. So when you scale the variable, it's just like multiplying an equation like both sides of the equation by the same coefficient. It's the same thing, just easier to digest. Yep, the only thing that it's gonna change, this is why I was kind of going through these, R squared doesn't change, statistical significance doesn't change. The only thing that changes is our interpretation of that slope coefficient. Because we said it's always a one unit change and we've changed the units, right? The unit is no longer $1, it's $1,000, yep. Any questions that or anything else? We're good over there. So, um, what do I want to do here? Oh, you know, making the point here, if we're then trying to kind of measure now, what is the economic significance? Well, here we're measuring the economic significance not of a $1 increase, but of a $1,000 increase. So we would do the same way. We would take that slope coefficient of 0.1179, divide it by that dependent variable's mean. So we're seeing here, now a change of $1,000, is that having an economically large impact? Well, 
it's only about 1.3% of the dependent variable. I mean, it's not that large, right? Its economic significance is not that great. Um, let me think instead. This data set's not great for it. I think if we have one that is, so I think it's worth kind of, well, we'll revisit this in a different example. We've got some data sets later on. I'll kind of revisit this idea of economic significance, okay? So scaling variables, talking about economic significance. Um, I already kind of mentioned this, the R squared doesn't change, P values don't change, um, nothing really changes other than the interpretation of that slope coefficient because the units are now different. So I think here, I kind of put all of this in here, right? Um, this is just kind of a summary of everything I just said. Um, or no, it's not, sorry, this is another thing. This is not scaling, this is a different type of scaling. We just scaled the variable, I left that blank slide there. So the next thing we'll talk about is a different type of scaling, and we've kind of already touched on this. So this is one of the slides that I can add it in from last class. So sometimes we might wanna think about, you know, is a thousand dollars increase, is that an actual large increase in income? Well, if I see the variance on income is pretty large, it might not even be like half of the standard deviation. So sometimes what we'll do is we'll standardize these variables. I think I even asked you to do that in problem set two, if I remember right, for one of the variables. And the reason why we standardize is because now, once I standardize a variable, so I subtract the mean, divide by the standard deviation, right? So how do I get this, right? We've talked about this already. Subtract the mean of the variable, divide by the standard deviation. So if I now have kind of a um, standardized dependent variable, what is the interpretation of my X variable now? So it's a one unit change in X would cause the predicted Y value to change by whatever that slope coefficient is. But now the units of my Y variable, if I was doing something like wage, it's not the dollar increase in wage, it's the standard deviation increase in wage, right? I've changed the units of that dependent variable to be standard deviation changes. I can do the exact same thing for the independent variable, right? So, you know, I think it's a reasonable change here. Now the interpretation would become, right? A one standard deviation increase in that independent X variable causes the predicted Y variable to change by whatever that slope coefficient is. Um, what happens if we standardize both? Well, now it's a one standard deviation unit change in X causes the predicted Y value to go up by whatever the slope coefficient is, standard deviations. So let's work through an actual, some actual data here. And maybe this will be easier to kind of make these interpretations once we have some values, not just kind of speaking in generalities. So let's say I want to run, go back to using the old income variable just for the sake of doing it. So here. What happens if we standardize our dependent variable? So what are the things that I'm going to need to standardize it? I actually think that there's a built-in formula, but I forget what it is. So we'll just kind of go through the manual creation. So I'm going to generate the cigarette mean by just taking the mean of that cigarette variable. And then I'm going to create standard deviation, which is just the standard deviation of that cigarette variable. Now, if I try to run these, why is it not going to run? What did I forget? Well, you have to use EJ, right? Yeah, if I use built-in format like functions like the mean or the standard deviation, that's where we said when you use that e gen, right? So now I should be able to run these okay. Sometimes I'll, I'll make points like that. So if you catch me missing something, that's usually good. trying to make a point. That's a you know, easy thing to forget there, right? So I've now got the mean and standard deviation. Now I'm just going to create cigarettes or six stand which is gonna be just take my cigarette use variable, subtract the mean, and divide by my standard deviation. So I'm gonna go ahead and run this. I now I'm gonna have this cigarette variable standardized. Notice, now it, you know everything looks like it's here, pretty small, like 1.5, 1.9. Well, that's because it's not very likely we're gonna see things two or three or four standard deviations away. In fact, what's the likelihood we see something that's two standard deviations away? We use the standard normal to approximate. 1.96 gave us 0.025 in the tail. So, I mean, 
we're looking at something three or four standard deviations away, it's very unlikely we're gonna see those observations in our data set, right? Most things are gonna be within one or two standard deviations of the mean, which sure enough, I mean, right here, look at all these values. Oh, here's one that's a little high, right? So they can happen, but most of them are kind of right around that mean. So I'm now going to go back up here and just copy this regression equation for space. So I'm now going to run this with my standardized cigarette variable. So I'm going to run this regression, look at the kind of results, right? Now, if I'm looking at, say, uh, years of education here, how would I interpret that slope coefficient? So what's a one unit change in my X variable? Having education is measured in years. I'm okay with awkward silence. Because what's a one unit change in education if it's measured in years? Having one more year of education, right? Mm -hmm. It's a one unit increase would cause my, or predict that my Y value changes by, what, it would go down by 0 0.027, but because I'm using the standardized bit of, you know, values of that dependent variable, it's going down 0 0.027 what? Standard deviations. That's relatively small, right? So this is another way of measuring kind of economic significance, right? We, we saw before with the education variable, it had a relatively small percent of the dependent variables mean, right? The economic significance wasn't that large. Once again, here, moving 0 0.027 of a standard deviation isn't that much of a movement, right? Typically, we would want to think about, you know, moving a half a standard deviation or a full standard deviation. That starts to be like really large economic significance. Any questions on this? Do you so, use the standardized variable in the regression, or do you just use the same? Yep, so the reason why I can now change the interpretation, right, the reason why this is now a 0 0.027 increase in the, or, oh, sorry, 0 0.027 decrease in the standard, 0 0.027 standard deviation decrease in my Y variable is because I'm using the standardized version of it, right? If I wasn't, going back before, notice the coefficient's different. Why? Because now I would interpret this as one more year of education predicts that cigarette use goes down by 0.376 packs per month or however, it's, whatever the units of that cigarette use variable was. I don't even have to worry about, if I don't know, like let's say I got this data set and like I said, I'd have to go back and look at the code book. I think it's packs per month, but I don't exactly remember. It doesn't matter if I don't know the units. If I standardize it, now I know the units, right? Once I'm using the standardized version of the variable, I know these unit changes are going to be the number of standard deviation increases or decreases, right? So another kind of valuable thing in being able to standardize these variables is we don't have to worry about the original units of the variable, okay? Any other questions on this? We keep going, okay? So the next thing I kind of mentioned is, well, I can do this exact same thing. So I'm going to copy and paste this regression. But I'm going to look at that education variable, and I'm going to create, oops, I already forgot, EGEN, uh, education mean, which is just the mean of this education variable. I'm going to create another variable, which is the standard deviation. So just SD, calculate the standard deviation of the education variable. And then I'm going to create the standardized version of education, which is just take the education value, subtract the mean, and divide by, whoops, what did I call this? Education, divide by the standard deviation. Okay. So I'm just standardizing now, not my dependent variable, but that independent variable of education, right? So I'm gonna run this once again, and look at these values and see, You know, these are, you know, here's something two standard deviations away, but most things are like 0 0.3, 1 1.8, 0 0.8, negative 0.15. Really, everything's pretty close, right? Not that many standard deviations away. <coughs> so I've now got this standardized education variable. I'm going to copy, get rid of some of these lines of code so we can kind of have these comparisons. I'm going to paste down here. Now, instead of using my standardized version of my dependent variable, 
I'm going to go back to just using cigarette use, like the original variable itself. It's just now I'm going to use the standardized variable of education. Okay. So if I now run this regression, how can I interpret these results? So I look at my education variable now. We'll notice compared to before, the coefficients are different. And why? Because I've changed the units of this variable education. Now, what would a one unit increase in this education variable, which I've standardized be? Once I've standardized it, it's essentially like a Z value. So a one unit increase would be a one standard deviation increase. So having a one standard deviation increase in the years of education you have, right? Would, in, would decrease the predicted cigarette use by 1.15 you know, cigarette packs per month, or whatever that, that uh, unit of that cigarette variable would be. Okay, so this one's kind of nice. You know, it's, it's nice in the sense of, especially if like I had income, we could do this exact same thing. You know, those income values, even when we scaled it to be a thousand, they were pretty small because we could see 10, we could see really large changes in income. I'm just going to go through here and do the exact same thing. Oops. For income, just standardize it just to have another point of comparison. So, income. Go through like a search replace. Oops. Make this point. So if instead, I'm going to run this, then use the standardized value of income here. So I'm going to go here. This was my original regression, just so I can kind of compare. I'm going to rerun that. Now run my new regression. Dependent variable is still cigarette use, not standardized. But now I'm using a standardized variable for income. Notice now I can think about if I have a one unit change in that standardized income variable, so if income goes up by one standard deviation, the increase in the number of packs per month smoked would be one, right? I have a much larger kind of effect because I'm now thinking about, you know, an actual standard deviation. In fact, what is a standard deviation increase? Looks like 9,000. Right? So when we were doing changes of a dollar or changes of a thousand dollars, even when we scaled it, that wasn't a very large change. The standard deviation of this variable is nine. That's a reasonable change for us to expect to see in the data, right? In fact, you know, we could see more than that because within one standard deviation, that's a vast majority of the data. You could easily see like two standard deviation increases. So sometimes, you know, instead of scaling it by just changing the units like we did earlier, making it thousands or tens of thousands, kind of just standardizing it, there you can start to think about, okay, now it's a one unit change in the X variable is a one standard deviation increase, right? Or one standard deviation change. Any questions on this idea before we keep moving? Okay. Got one more. We'll kind of switch topics a little bit. So let's say, Let's say now I want to use both of them. So both the independent and the dependent variable, I want to standardize. Right? So I've already standardized, I already created those variables, but now I want to run a regression where my dependent variable I've standardized, and I've also standardized a couple of my independent variables. So if I run this regression, how would I interpret now that education standard deviation variable? So what's a one unit change in that variable? If education goes up by, if it's standardized, the units are standard deviations. So a education goes up by one standard deviation, right? The predicted change in my standardized cigarette use variable, it would go down by 0 0.08 standard deviations, right? Once I've standardized both these variables, everything is in terms of standard deviation changes. Now, I still interpret my slope coefficient as a one unit change, so it's always going to be a one standard deviation change in my x variable. It's going to cause my predicted y variable to change by whatever that slope coefficient is, number of standard deviations. 
Um, and it's always kind of context specific if it makes sense to do this. Um, you know, with the income variable here, we can start to think about we've now kind of standardized everything. So if income goes up by one standard deviation, our predicted cigarette use goes up by about 0 0.04 standard deviations. So we looked at like the old regression. We might kind of incorrectly be like, oh, education matters a lot more than income, right? Look at how much larger that slope coefficient is. But if we put both of them in terms of standard deviation changes, right? Because a one unit change in income was $1, Education was one more year of education. Those are very different. It's hard to compare those, with the, the, the effect sizes. But once we've standardized both of them, now I can think about, well, which of these is really having a larger economically significant impact on that dependent variable? The same standard, right? Each one of them now are changing by one standard deviation. If education is changing by one standard deviation, just decreasing it by about 0 0.08. Income would be increasing it by about close to 0 0.08. They're really about the same Effect, right? They're really having kind of the same economic significance or same kind of magnitude of, of an effect if each of them increased by a standard deviation. Any questions? Yeah. So I think in the problem set, when you standardize the independent variable, the intercept became the mean of the dependent variable, right? Does that apply to these like multiple variable examples? Yeah, so it won't quite be that. Right, so it only works with simple linear regression yeah. that we can interpret the intercept and the slope coefficient that way. Yeah. Um, if I standardized every single variable of my independent variables, uh -huh. then my intercept, right, because then everything would be at zero, yeah. right, right at its mean, it would have to be the, it would then represent kind of the mean of, yeah. yeah but we don't have that here, so we can't quite technically interpret it that way. Yeah. It's a good question. <laughs> Any other questions here before we keep moving? Okay. So I do have something else I want to touch on that we did last class. Let me make sure. Okay. Uh, there was one more thing I wanted to point out, which was I said this before when we scaled income. Notice, though, even though these coefficients are changing, notice that the p-values are still always the same. My r squareds still always at 0 0.0106. So even when we standardize these variables, it's not changing any of the statistical significance. It's just allowing us to get a better idea of the economic significance, right? And it's only going to change the interpretation of our slope coefficients. The statistical significance, at our R squared, everything should be exactly the same. Okay. Any questions on this before we keep moving? Okay. Um, I then had this kind of thought experiment. So we talked a little bit about our adjusted R squared once again last class. And we said it can be influenced by two things. One, the number of independent and vari independent variables we include, but also our sample size. Okay. So just kind of a rule of thumb. I kind of have them summarized here. So I know we talked through them last class, but if K goes up, right? So if I start throwing more variables into my regression, what's gonna happen to that multiplying factor on the right-hand side? I'll even kind of walk through this with arrows because I think it might be, be helpful. And I think I did this last class, but it's probably helpful to see it again. So here's my adjusted R squared. It's gonna be, one minus the proportion of the variation I can't explain times this factor, which penalizes me for adding in more independent um, variables on the right-hand side. So if K is going up, what's happening to my denominator? If I'm subtracting a larger value, it's going to get smaller. If my denominator gets smaller, what's happening to this fraction? If I'm dividing by a smaller number, this will get larger. If I'm then subtracting a larger number, what's happening to my adjusted R squared? It's going down, right? So adding in more independent variables is always going to pull that adjusted R squared down. Now, we also said what happens, well, I'll rewrite it so we don't, we don't have colors. It might be kind of hard to reproduce this in your notes. 
So if I increase my sample size, right, and it gets maybe a little bit harder to see here, but as I increase my sample size, what's happening to like the gap in between these? Well, think about it this way. If I had one and two, well, one and two are good. If I had, um, let's say K was two and N was 10, right? This would become what? Nine over seven? If this was 100, what would this become? This would be 99 over 97. This is getting a lot closer to what? One. One, right? So increasing my sample size is actually going to be decreasing this factor, bringing it closer and closer to one. So as I increase my sample size, this multiplying factor goes down, which means I'm subtracting a smaller number. So what's going to happen to my adjusted R squared? I'm subtracting a smaller number. It's going to go up. So this was the idea that as we add in more of these independent variables, we know it's going to negatively impact that adjusted R squared. I shouldn't say negatively. It's going to decrease it. One way we can combat that, if we do want to include all these additional variables, increase our sample size. Right? So we can kind of combat that by increasing our sample size. I wanted to kind of prove this to you in state of here. So also kind of show you maybe a little bit more of its, its capabilities. So I'm going to um, go back. I have, I think I added in some additional variables here because I, I just found, I, or I found them. So let's do, So I'm gonna run this regression where I've included some additional variables. So here I've got my output. Um, you know, my adjusted R squared is 0 0.0117. Okay. So I'm going to generate some random numbers, right? You don't have to worry too much about this. I won't make you recreate this. All this is gonna do is it's gonna generate some random numbers and randomly sample 100 of the observations. So I'm gonna run this code. Now I'm gonna add on, I only wanna run this regression if they're in this smaller sample, right? So I run this regression here. Notice with a really small sample size. So we said high sample sizes will help increase that adjusted R squared. If I get really small sample sizes, especially when I have like, uh, you know, I'm including quite a few variables here. Notice what happens to my R squared? It's actually negative, right? Which is really weird. Um, that usually won't be the case because we're usually not dealing with data sets of 100, right? That's relatively small. But you can kind of see here with those smaller sample sizes, that adjusted R squared is going to get really, really low. So we want to increase our sample size. If we use the entire data set, that should increase our adjusted R squared. Sure enough, now it's kind of positive. It makes a little bit more sense, right? You know, we've got 800 observations as opposed to just 100 of them. Now, what should happen if I instead, in including all these variables, what if I only include these four, right? Well, it's hard to exactly know, right? Because my R squared should go down. I'm using fewer variables to explain that Y variable, right? However, if I'm using fewer variables when I'm subtracting K, right, that denominator is now gonna be a little bit larger. So that kind of multiplying factor is, is gonna be um, a little bit small, right? That gap is kind of closing in between that numerator and denominator. So I can run this and kind of see, okay? So I have an R squared of 0 0.019 here. When I included these additional variables, they weren't necessarily that much better at predicting cigarette use. So I ended up with, what, 0 0.019 and, wait, is that on the same? No, yeah, 0 0.019. I actually, explain the exact same proportion of variation. Now, these probably aren't exactly the same. They're just the same to the third or fourth decimal, right? But adding these two additional variables, it should have changed my adjusted R squared. So notice when I only include four variables here, my adjusted R squared is 0 0.0141. Whereas when I've included one, two, three, four, five, six, I've still got the same R squared, but my adjusted R squared now is even lower, right? adding in more of those independent variables is gonna pull that adjusted R squared down, right? So 0 0.014 to 0 0.011. So just kind of, you know, using data to kind of prove these things to us that as we add more independent variables, the adjusted R squared kind of moving in the opposite direction. So maybe it makes more sense if I, uh, here, I'll run them in the 
this order. So here I only had four variables here, I've got six. So my adjusted R squared should be going down as I add more independent variables. And then um, we kind of saw that example with the sample size. If I have smaller sample sizes, that's gonna really pull my adjusted R squared down. I want larger sample sizes to kind of combat that. Any questions over anything there? Okay. Um, we talked about this a little bit last class. This is what I'm going to save for Tuesday's class doing joint hypothesis testing. Um, okay. Any other questions before we just going to call this in class work? Post this so it has some of the stuff we added while we we're in class. Excuse me. No questions? Okay. So I'm going to show you something I think is, well, maybe if I didn't break this data here trying to save us. Um, I brought an example that maybe some of you will find interesting. Um, if you don't find the exact data set or topic interesting, think about it. You can apply it to a lot of different, different uh, types of data sets. So I'm going to open up, and I think I put this on, on Stata, but I've got this fantasy football example. Um, I come down here. Did I save it at any point? No. So I'm going to run this. Let's see. Hopefully this runs. Let's see. Not going to drag. Did I drag and put these in my... So let's see. So fantasy points. Point import NFL data. So NFL player data. That's there. Fantasy points. So I just need to change my path to whatever I have it up here. So those files would be in your OneDrive. Here I'm going to Find this. Come down here. There we go. Just going to import this. Make sure all this will run real quick. Player data. Oh, because it's in. Hold on. What happens when I try to close off the cuff? Wasn't sure if we have time for this or not, but I think it's kind of interesting. So now let's try this. There we go. So I had this uh, fantasy football data laying around. I then had all this player data. So we'll kind of come down here and I'll kind of tell you some more interesting things. So run this regression. What's it like now? Oh, because I didn't put my path somewhere here. Um, so I've got Um, just kind of to show the power of what we can do in making these predictions. So I had this fantasy football data. I had this idea of like, could you predict what someone's performance is going to be the following season based off of their previous season's performance, right? So you could do this with anything. I could predict countries' GDPs, right? Even though things haven't occurred yet, you know, this, this next year, I can take whatever they did the year before, run a regression, start to make predictions about what's going to happen next year, right? Or it stops, right? We could do it for that as well. So um, I had these variables kind of laying around, different statistics. I measured them and I see, okay, I'm going to go through this and I'm not going to make you guys do this, but I'll just tell you a little bit of what it's doing. It's basically creating these new variables that are kind of using what we call the lag. So it was taking Baker Mayfield's performance numbers from 2022 and putting them in 
to his current or into the 2023 data so that I've got like the previous year's statistics. So I had some problems if I try to run this regression. Oh, there it goes, right? So I've kind of, you might think, well, I've got like all these missing values here. Stata will essentially ignore those missing values. So it will only include observations in your, your regressions if you have a value for every single variable that you've put into your regression. Okay. So notice here, like the number of observations is what, 142. But when I look at my regression, it's only 78. Well, that's because some years we didn't have any data from the previous year. So think about like a, a rookie quarterback, right? Or maybe it was just the first year we had in our data set. We didn't have anything prior to that. So we've now got only got observations where I know what their performance was the year before. Okay. I could then run a regression where I look at the current kind of number of points mm -hmm. and see how good of a predictor were the previous year's statistics on the current year's points scored on this fantasy football, right? They said, this seems dumb. You could do this with stocks, right? You could look at what's the current valuation of this stock and how can I predict the current valuation based off of the prior year's performance on you know, whatever these different measures are of the, the company's performance. So all we have to do once we've got these lag kind of variables associated with the current performance, whether or not that's fantasy football, stocks, GDP, we can just use this predict command. Now I put this comma XB, it usually defaults to it. Um, that's why I haven't mentioned it in class, but I, here, because I have some of these missing values, I wanted to make sure that it defaulted to it. Um, so I can kind of come up with these predictions. So what you could then do is think about for every single one of these quarterbacks, my new predicted variable is based off of the prior year's performance, what's their predicted outcome or what's their predicted performance this next year, right? And I can do that for every single one of these, these different quarterbacks. Now, what I could also do is like we started out at the beginning of class, I could use that display command and say, okay, Instead of like doing it for the current, you know, making these predictions for who's in this data set, maybe I want to do this like hypothetical quarterback that maybe for whatever reason, I didn't have that quarterback in my data set. Like, I don't know why that would exist in this case, right? But let's say it's for a company that just wasn't in the data, but I want to make a prediction for what their stock price is. I can use all these coefficients on the previous performance measures, plug in this company's performance measures from the year before and get what their predicted stock price would be for the next year. So, you know, just kind of thinking about it, it seems stupid. And it seems like we're not doing a lot with these predictions. But there's some really powerful stuff we could do. And we haven't talked about how you would create these like lag variables. We'll eventually get there when we talk about panel data later on in the semester. But I just thought, this, you know, it's football season. Um, it's a good point to kind of show like we can make some predictions, right? And yeah, fantasy football numbers are dumb, but like stock price valuations are, are not, right? Or GDP measures are not. Right, or, or company performance, like these are all things that we can predict as long as we have you know, previous data. Right? Um, so you're the guy that no one wants in their fantasy league, huh? I haven't done this. I don't, I, I stay away from fantasy, but you can, uh, I talked to some, I don't know if it was in this section or not. Uh, you can do this exact same thing with betting data and you can try to predict what lines, this is getting kind of nerdy and it's whatever, but you can predict what lines should be. So your dependent variable is kind of what the point spread should be or what the uh, over under on the game should be. You can just use all this previous data to predict what it should be. Then you can go out, look at the actual point spread that different companies are offering. If there's is too high, you can kind of identify where there's some value to be had, right? If you can come up with a prediction now, doing this in practice, guess what these companies are also doing? Exactly. <laughs> so it's very hard to find those opportunities, um, but you know, occasionally you can. Um, occasionally, if you can think of something that might matter in predicting that point spread that the company hasn't factored in, well, then if you've got a variable in your regression that they don't, you might actually be able to make better predictions, and there you might be able to find what we would call like arbitrage opportunities. Same kind of idea with stocks. Right? All these financial companies, they're, they're doing the same thing, trying to predict what the valuation of the stock is. If they're missing something, though, if there's some measure of a company that they just don't have not thought of that would be good at making better predictions, if you can come up with what that is, you can kind of find some, some, uh, some prop or some gains to be had in the, in, in the buying and selling of that stock. Um, 
anyways, so I, I digress a little bit, but I think it's, uh, I'm trying to kind of go more big picture, like what we're doing with things and kind of, we can kind of see where we're moving towards and the kind of things that we could do. So we got a little bit early today. Um, like I said, we're moving a little bit quicker than, than I thought. So I, rehashing some of the stuff we talked about, like with the adjusted R squared, saw some new stuff today. We've got one more topic that we're going to go through. So it's kind of setting a roadmap next week. I think we'll get through most of it on Tuesday. If not, it might bleed into Thursday a little bit. I'll probably even if it does, we do get through. I'll just do some more examples on Thursday. But we're going to talk about something called joint significance and comparing models, right? Does, does this regression, is it more reliable than this other one? Well, we can look at the R squared, but there's actually a way we can measure, is there a statistically significant difference between those R squares? Um, so we'll do that next week. We then have uh, one more week, all right? So we've got next week, we'll be doing new material. It'll then be a full week, and then the next week will be the exam. So that full week, shouldn't really be doing anything new. Um, I'll just be kind of going back through things we've already talked about, bringing in some additional examples. I'll also end up getting a practice exam up at the end of next week, so we can work through in that week, really three days. We'll have three class periods of essentially review. Right. Uh, I want you guys to do well in the exam. I'm not doing this for me. So, you know, once again, this is going to be recorded. So hopefully the people who aren't here and are hearing me talk, maybe I should talk louder. Um, those three class periods, yeah, I'm not, I'm doing, you know, every, most everything's probably going to be on the dot cam. That's not going to be recorded. And so that's going to be review for the exam. I would highly suggest you make sure you're at those three classes, right? Because I wrote the exam. So I probably know like what you might want to focus on. Okay. Um, other than that, um, any last minute questions on that problem set? Shoot an email, stop by office hours tomorrow, 10 to 12. Otherwise, have a fun, safe weekend, and I will see you guys on Tuesday. Okay.